podcast, you are trapped in history with Mr. Malcolmson and Miss Basham. Today, we are going to kind of pick up where we left off with the last episode. Um, we ended with the Little Ice Age and the Great Famine, and today we're going to talk a, quite a bit about a topic that I think is more interesting, um, the Black Death, also known as the Bubonic Plague. So just to kind of look back a little bit, every episode, we're going to try and connect it back to the previous one a little. Uh, we ended with talking about how, you know, the world was freezing over and everybody was really hungry. We were going through a famine. And so one thing to think about when you're cold, when you're hungry, your immune system drops quite a bit, which leads you much to be much more susceptible to catching diseases, getting sick. I mean, think about when flu season hits in the colder times, you know, and so a lot of times if you're, you're hungry, on top of that, you don't have the nutrients you need, your body can't fight things off. So that coupled with the plague being spread around um, is really what caused it to hit really, really hard. Um, so, Mr. Malcolmson, why don't you tell a little bit about how the bubonic plague started, uh, where did it start, how did it spread, why don't you give some background information on that? No problem, and just also to build it into today, just looking back real quick, you also don't have the type of quarantining going on back then that you have now. I mean, people had lives to live to a point where they, they had to farm or they would, it's not just about money, it's starving to death and whatnot. And it, it took a long time for them to be able to quarantine effectively. And that's one of the reasons why we take the measures today governments do is because we've learned lessons from events like this plague or like the Spanish flu in the 1918 and whatnot. So let's get into this Black Death. As we said a little bit last episode, you know, we're going to call this, topic uh, one of two words so we'll either call it the black death or the bubonic plague the reason why we call it the bubonic plague is because we show you a picture and i'll probably put a picture on this podcast for you to see as well too is that you used to get these big black boils all over your body and those boils were called buboes and that's where the name bubonic plague really extends from and one of the things that we start with early and in an easy place as a historian mrs basham as you would agree is really what are the causes of this what really gets it started and just like we said last episode Asia is flourishing within this part, and, and there's rumors that, you know, whether it's ships packed with silk or food and whatnot are being shipped from there over to the Mediterranean Sea where Italy's at and other places. You know, is it coming from that? Because rats get on the ships and fleas get on the ships, and all of a sudden you're arriving in port cities in Italy and in Greece and other places, and like a cancerous tumor, the plague just starts to spread slowly through the belly of Europe and getting to other places. You also had weird stories like the, uh, you know, the Turks going to war, you know, fighting in different battles along the, I think, the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea putting dead bodies that are infected in catapults and literally launching them over the walls of their enemies so the dead bodies that are rotting land in these cities and you're also spreading disease. So there's many reasons other than just those two, but it's mainly considered spreading through rats and fleas and really extending and made it worse because of the way shipping was done at that point. Ms. Basham, do you have anything to add as far as the causes of this? I was going to say it's another effect that that had was the great cat massacre which i know both of us being animal lovers is also like oh, <laughs> because uh, you know at the time they weren't sure what caused the disease you know we know now looking back that it was fleas and rats but what kills rats cats and so their thought process at the time was oh well it must be the cat's fault so cats were being slaughtered you know by the dozens by the hundreds and yep. so looking back is the great cat massacre <laughs> i mean you have a, a lack of medicine you have a lack of hygiene you have people that literally dump their human waste in the streets and then they're like i can't believe this is happening I, have the whole day. <laughs> I mean you think cats love to kill rodents so we round up because we think it might be from cats you round out most mm -hmm. of the cats and kill them and then of course the rats are just like yeah yeah, like whatever it might be, it just extends even worse through the whole process. So as they're able to figure out what it is, and there's lots of other things, like Miss Basham said last episode, many peasants are very superstitious people as well too. So then all of a sudden the questioning of religion comes into, because now we're getting into the duration other than just the causes of this. I do, on the causes front, I do want to share the screen a little bit here, as Miss Basham would agree with me on, and show a little bit about, I'll get to that in a minute, but let's start off with this one, and I'll move our little picture down here a little bit. And we see a map of Europe again, similar to the one that we had that last episode, and we see a bunch of arrows. This is another map that's on one of the assignments. 
comments coming up on here. And can you explain a little bit about the context of this map, Ms. Basham? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the key over there, it shows what the different colors represent. So where it starts and then the arrows kind of show the direction in which it traveled. So it started with that green right there on the right hand side. And because of economics and trade uh, and because now they were trading year round, it wasn't just seasonal. You can see it's starting to spread out farther and farther to the west. So that is, you know, this map really shows exactly how the order it spread in, how it spread, where it started. Um, and you can see, I mean, it spread rapidly. It just goes 1346 to 1353. I mean, that's just a handful of years, not even 10. So uh, yeah, it spread really quick, spread, started in Asia, worked its way over because of trade, because of economics. Mm -hmm. And you can tell it's confusing with all the arrows, but nothing really spreads in a linear way from just like point A to point B to point C. I mean, it's spreading in all kinds of different directions. And because of events like this, you, you do see states and national governments taking measures today to prevent things like this. This is what they're scared of, is things going from that way. And, and that's what countries at least attempt to avoid, is something like this. Now, to build off of what I was going to say earlier, because I wanted to make sure I showed this picture, is that superstitious factor. Because now we're going to talk about a topic, and this is where, for the next three units or so, this is going to come up often, and that is religion and, and the Catholic Church at the time. The Catholic Church is the most powerful organization in all of Europe, even more powerful than the kings and queens at this moment. And you do have the Holy Roman Empire, which is just fragmented. It's, it's very little that's left of the old Roman Empire that's under. So it's not really Roman anymore. And it's not even really that holy. And it's mostly in what today is Germany uh, for the most part. But you do have people that they just don't know what to do with in this, this virus. And I'm going to go to this picture, which is on another assignment. I think it's on the last assignment that we have on the Middle Ages stuff. And again, we don't have a really close picture, but I can probably take some pictures and maybe find some ones that are zoomed in. I think on our assignment, Ms. Basham, we took a small part and really zoomed in on it so you can yeah. see it. So peasants started to worry that maybe it wasn't about their bad health and their bad living conditions and you know, murdering cats or doing other measures that were superstitious, but maybe it was more about God. Maybe it was divine. Maybe we deserve this. Maybe God was punishing us for our sins, and maybe that's why it was happening. People would pray. People would go to monasteries, seek help from monks, um, try to get help from other places. However, um, people were still dying randomly, or we can say the word indiscriminately, they were dying, because it didn't matter who you are. We go back to feudalism, it, the disease doesn't care if you own land, or if you're a church worker, or if you're a king or queen, it kills indiscriminately. Is there anything that you want to add as far as like the, the impact on the on regular society? Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate just a little bit and provide another perspective. You know, you talked about how people were very superstitious. We know that before this, the church played a huge part in everybody's life. Um, and you did have the people who, you know, started saying, oh, why are we being punished? What did we do? Let's, you know, go to church more and let's tithe more. But then on the flip side, which is the devil's advocate part, you also started to have people who started to question church and religion. And Well, why is this happening? Why is God punishing us? What have we done? I've worked in the fields my whole life. Um, so you start to see, now, it's not quite so much as um, you'll see in the next unit, but you start to see that questioning there, which wasn't there as much initially. So I think that exactly. that starts the, the yeah. whatever that is, the divide. Yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> now, I will add in there, too, is there something else that ties similar into what we've been experiencing with the coronavirus. If you paid any attention to the news, and I understand if you've been trying to avoid it like the plague because it can be very negative at times, but if you notice that where you lived mattered too, because in this era, within medieval like or middle ages in the urban conditions, so if you lived in a city like Rome or Venice or maybe England, or I'm sorry, London or Manchester or Paris or something, you were even more susceptible to the disease if you were living in close quarters in an urban city area. And just like in the coronavirus, one of the hardest hit places was New York City or Los Angeles or Detroit because people are congregated really closely. The living conditions are going to be more claustrophobic, um, less ventilation and whatnot. But that's not to say that people out in the uh, farms, in the villages or guilds 
are any or any are not affected either. And, and Miss Bastion, you and I discussed this a little bit this summer. Could you could you tell the kids like if you have like a little village, you know, who to you in your opinion in a little village, who's probably the most important person in that village? And if that person goes down, if they die, that could devastate the entire economy of that village. Well, whenever we talked about it this summer, it really surprised me. You know, I don't want to say what the right answer is, but what yeah. using evidence could seem like a really, really correct answer would be the blacksmith. And, you know, whenever we first talked about it, I was like, man, why, why the blacksmith? Because in my head, I'm going, you know, farmers and, uh, you know, listing up doctors. But then, you know, whenever we talked, you made a really great point that with the blacksmith, that's how you get your weapons for protection. That's how you get your tools for all of these other professions. Um, you can't farm if you don't have the necessary tools that you need to do that. Uh, and so, like you said earlier, the black death killed indiscriminately. I mean, it didn't care who you were, what job you had, how important you were. It would take whoever it took. And so whenever blacksmiths would catch it and pass in a community, that would affect that whole area because it wasn't like now where you go to school and you're training and you're like, okay, we got 15 blacksmiths to choose from. It was, okay, we need uh, the one guy. He might have an apprentice if we're lucky, but a lot of times they didn't. So if that one guy, if something happened to him, then the whole community was short from a blacksmith. Yeah, it reminds me of, like, if you go to the CTC here at the high school and you do a machine tools class, yeah. you might end up working in a factory or an industry and making it in more of an assembly line or at least more of a, a quicker fashion. So, they're, like you said, it's, it's, it's easier to access tools and whatnot today. And But back then, like, you, most villages, if not all of them, just had one blacksmith. And that ripple effect, if they die, what do you do now? And we, we talked about the farmers, the weapons, but what even about the house? Like, like you had women that were expected to raise the family and nurture the family in the home. But what if you had no no kettle, you had no uh, iron skillet? You, I mean, you're, you're affecting like food production, you're affecting protection and whatnot. It just shakes up the entire structure of your society. And that can be very devastating. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go poach some other villages, exactly. uh, blacksmith, and then that village is going to get upset with me. So now, yep. you know, we're not really living in harmony along with the famine, the ice age, and the plague. Now we're all fighting yep. against each other, you know. So Miss Bassett, this would be like a little political joke. Would a blacksmith be labeled, if they were today, would they be labeled as an essential worker? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. And again, it makes you look now today at like, who are essential workers and why are they labeled essential workers? And you think of these are jobs that keep the entire economy running and keep the utilities running, things that people have to have. People like you said, what was it, either this episode or last episode, you talked about the necessity of water. And, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if it's wintertime, you've got to have heat and gas and whatnot. These are things that you keep going, but it doesn't reduce the risk of getting the virus, whether it is the plague back then or the coronavirus now, or it was the Spanish flu in the 19 teens or the 1920s, it, it just it just changes. So I understand why people take precautions. Now let's get a little bit into the, the mortality rate side of this. We haven't really shared, and this is something that's important for the students too with their assignments is, and I'll go back to the screen too again, just to show you a little bit of that artwork again, because it is on the assignments and it helps a little bit. But what was the mortality rate like uh, for this, uh, especially in Europe? Um, so for just for clarification, mortality rate is, you know, how quickly and effectively and how many people it kills. It's not just who it infects, it is who dies from this. And so it actually ended up killing over a third of the European population. So 30 to 60 percent. And, you know, we compared that to the coronavirus mortality rates, which are still higher than we would want them to be, obviously. But whenever we were looking it up yesterday, it was less than 1% globally, globally, worldwide. And so whenever you look at that comparison, I mean, 30%, can you imagine what it would be like, the fear you would live in? Uh, like I said, you're going to try and stay away from people. You don't know what's causing it. And you don't have the science and the background that you have now. You don't know. So all you can really do is fall back on what you do know, which is your religion, your faith. Uh, why is this happening? Why did, are so many people passing? Um, so, yeah, it had an insanely, ridiculously high mortality rate. 
And, and it leads into a lot of problems, even as it's declining. It leads into a lot of problems that we're going to address in the next three chapters or so, too, because you, you know, an individual could argue that you know, the Catholic Church tries to do the best that they can at helping in this situation in the monasteries and whatnot, but some leaders in the Catholic Church start to take advantage of this, and they know people's commitment and the fear of the afterlife is very apparent now. And they get into something that we'll get to later called indulgences and whatnot. And it's like even more pressure to have your sins relieved and have salvation in the church start raising money. But like you said, people's maybe trust in their faith is not as strong as it was before. And then for others, it becomes even more extreme. But the prestige of the church does get damaged in this experience of the Black Death. So that's why in the next chapter, you're going to start seeing a resurgence of the church because they're going to start spending more money on uh, phenomenal artwork, whether it's paintings or sculptures or whatnot. Because remember, most people in society are not literate. They're very visual, very storytelling. So they, when they walk into these churches, you want them to see the art, and the art has to tell the stories of the Old Testament or the New Testament, and they got to be able to get from that. So remember, it's a very visual society. And looking at this picture, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything, Miss Fashion. All I was going to add is, if you look really closely, you can see, for example, like a landowner, a vassal, or a noble on there, a queen, a king, a clergy member, a pope on there, and you see skeletons. And this is the first time this year we hit on the word symbolism. And actually, you did last episode with the Ice Age picture too, but I guess you can see there's more symbolism in this. The first obvious symbol that they'll see throughout the year is skeletons or a skull. And what does that usually mean? And in this context, Ms. Basham, what does it mean for these individuals? Usually, I mean, even now, whenever you think of skeletons, you think of death. And I mean, you think about Halloween and graveyards and uh, all that, but it's that death factor. So with this this painting, I, I think we said the name earlier, but I'm going to say it just the Dance Macabre. It looks like Dance Macabre, but it's Dance Macabre, which means dance of death. And it's showing that these people, no matter their station in society, they can't escape death. And death being, in this case, from the plague. Uh, this is, I would argue, this is probably the most symbolic painting of the bub bubonic plague. It, I would argue that. I mean, in this picture, you have a pathetic attempt of the skeletons to do their own version of TikTok. I mean, they're basically trying to dance their way around, but that's kind of a, it's a metaphor, of course, uh, where it's like everybody is playing the dance of death. It, it's a risk. It's like playing Russian roulette in a way with like a gun. It, it, it's just, it, it's all a risk. And no matter what they try to do, they try to avoid it. Um, this is another little Easter egg because Miss Basham, you put this in there. I've always loved this. This is a Halloween costume that I cannot wait to buy. Like if I, if I could, I would dress up as this at school. Could you imagine that? Six foot eight, 240 pounds. That would looking like that. <laughs> oh man, that would be awesome. I probably won't have anybody in my class that day. But when I, when I see this picture, I always wondered as a kid, why does it look like a bird and why the beak on there? And I don't know if there's like a, if the childhood nursery rhyme is still apparent today as maybe it was maybe when I was little, but they may have heard, you know, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We all fall down means we all fall dead on that. Um, and the pocket full of posy is like the flowers, kind of like, you know, people will have potpourri or incense today to make their house smell better. For a while, before they thought it was rats and fleas, some thought that it would be passed through smell. So at the end of the bird beak mask, they would put posies and flowers and things that smelled nice. So whenever the doctors, because most doctors actually did not even wear this mask. It was kind of a, it wasn't as widely as it makes it seem like it was. But people thought if they, if at least if they didn't smell like rotting flesh or whatever it might be, then they're not going to get sick. And so if you think about it, this mask did zero help off of that too. Now I know we're all wearing masks and you can say the mask that we have, it might help and it may not. So back then it's hard to say, maybe this mask helped and maybe it didn't. But if you notice, there's no ventilators on the mask or anything like that. And it does provide for a rather creepy, just look into the plague. I can't, I can't imagine a better symbol to, that represents this chapter other than really this one. Is there anything that you really want to say about what used to be famously called a plague doctor? Uh, well, I know a couple, last episode, I think it was, I was talking about Beauty and the Beast and the symbolism uh, whenever they go to Belle's childhood home and you see in the background this mask and that is how 
I knew and I geeked out in my head, like, oh my gosh, her mom died from the Black Death. Uh, it's because you see this mask there. And at the time, doctors and this mask were kind of, when you saw them, you knew they were probably visiting somebody that had the plague. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share screen, just kind of go back to our normal little conversation, because this is where we're going to kind of conclude, um, I guess, the last few topics that we have. So let's look at the, the, the consequences part two. Uh, you, you brought up the, um, the rate, the mortality rate, but let's kind of go in reverse. Do you think it also had a, uh, an impact on the fertility rate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are dying first off and that they did not discriminate against that. I mean, pregnant women passed too. So you had less children being, children were passing, less children being born. People are sick. People are not well fed because of the famine. People are really cold um, because of the ice age. So there were more than like, I haven't looked up the statistics for it, but there were more than likely less children born during this time and directly after. So whenever you have a third of the population you know, passing, there was not a quick replenishment, you know, real quick afterwards. So, yeah, it definitely affected the population for sure. And keep in mind, like, most of the statistics show that worldwide, the death rate for the coronavirus is, is you know, even less than, I think, 0.01%, whatever it might be. Uh, not to say that, you know, 800,000 or more deaths is not devastating. It incredibly is devastating. But imagine not 0 0.01, but 33% to 40 or 45% of everybody dies. And you, you can't tell me that your society is not extremely affected by that particular outcome. I want to bring up something else that kind of reminds some students, maybe make your mentor a little proud of you again here too, is let's do a little bit of a U.S. history reference and kind of get students ready for Mr. Webster or Mr. Z next year. And that is, what about like, a, as this started to progress forward, people started to sort of impose more increased hygiene on each other, uh, you know, uh, not, you know, throwing your waste out on the street, but working on making rudimentary sewer systems and working on trying to bathe in some way, even if it was in public bathing areas a little bit more, say, but quarantining. So you started to see more forced quarantining and forced hygienic practices. But imagine that in America today, imagine if the governor came in or the, or the federal government, they said, no, by law, you have to take a shower. I, or, because I mean, you, you got teenage boys that don't want to play video games for three days in a row and not shower, and you got to coerce them into like taking care of yeah. yourself. But it's one of those things. But imagine it's like, you know, I can already hear it now as many Americans be like, you're not going to tell me what to do, <laughs> even though we know what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's like we know it's the right thing to do. But man, as Americans, you know, we know our history and being originally a colony of the English and King George III ruling and all that PTSD memories from eighth grade that these sophomores might have is that anytime we hear the government getting a little bit controlling or, or mandating something for us to do, there are many Americans that scream, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like we see this is a slippery slope. So uh, people are often skeptical. So there is a little bit of like a utilitarian struggle between do what's best for the economy and risk kind of whatever is there or quarantine, but you, you also risk the growth or the economy collapsing and what might, and we're seeing that kind of struggle in our society now. So I, I guess you could say, even though we'd rather be in person, it's kind of the perfect year to really cover the black death of the bubonic plague. So it, as far as like finishing, I think this is a good place in general, just to finish up the plague. Is there anything that you just want to la lastly add about the plague? All I'm going to say is, imagine if our mask had to look like the ones that we showed earlier. Can you imagine? Yeah. We wouldn't be able to have the podcast. It would just... Pshaw, pshaw. Yeah. We all worked around with like, like bird beaks all the time. You're and, not and, used to it, so you turn next and you stab somebody. In the, oh, sorry. I don't know why, but that reminds me of like the old World War II pictures where you see like the bomb shelters and you see all the kids in the school wearing like the gas mm -hmm. mask. It yeah, looks yeah. So creepy. It's just like a room of kids. I mean, kids creep me out anyway, just because, you know, they're little human beings and they're, they're loud and whatnot. But I, I like kids. But you, you see them also with all these gas masks, like looking at the photograph. i got to find that somewhere. It's a really cool uh, picture. So let's do two last topics that, that in a way relate to 
summing up really this whole time period and a lot of the suffering that was going on. So one of them, uh, you had mentioned the dance macabre, and it's mainly a painting or a set of paintings. Some churches even had them as murals in the churches. I guess one more little last time, could you wrap up for the students in general, what, what's really the purpose of the dance macabre? Because on assignment five, they will have to do that painting that we showed earlier. What, what, what really should they gain as far as a deeper meaning out of that? Well, we've spoken about how people at the time were not literate, they were illiterate. So a lot of um, thoughts and ideas were communicated through artwork and through paintings. Uh, and we also spoke about symbolism and how you know important certain symbols were at the time. And so with this particular painting, the main thing I feel like we all need to get out of it is that death for this did not choose people. It did not say, oh, you right here, you're a peasant, you go with me. Oh, king, you, you're safe. It didn't do that. It killed indiscriminately. It killed whoever it didn't care about social status. It didn't care about jobs. Um, and I, I took that as the main point of view, the main purpose of this particular painting is that, you know, you can't escape death. You can't escape this plague. And I don't know if I'll put it on this episode, but I'll put it maybe on the, the Google Classroom later. You know that YouTube video that I sent you? It was like the Looney Tunes cartoon or the black and white quick cartoon of the skeletons dancing in a circle. I think and that's I one of our it, assignments. I think, yeah, it is. It's at yeah, the top. Yeah, one of our assignments. I think it's assignment number five. So they can click on that and you'll see kind of an animation of it. Now, Miss Basham, I interrupted you, but you were going to add something there. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, I was just going to ask you, you know, with people – being so superstitious, uh, some you know artists and individuals took advantage of that in their work, and uh, you know really tried to portray that. And one of those was Dante. And so I was going to ask if you wanted to cover you know Dante yeah. really briefly. I, I should help with this. I'm going to do something here because I, maybe I should have put it in the the, pa the page. But I'm going I'm to try to. I don't know. Maybe you can do it here, Miss Batchel, while I'm doing it on the other okay. side. But could you maybe look up a picture? Of, and I can uh, add Dante. it to that PowerPoint. Yeah, add it to that PowerPoint for me. There's a really good picture of Dante. It looks like he's wearing this big, giant, like, oversized uh, mumu in a way. Um, but it's just the, the odd style of clothing in the Middle Ages and whatnot. But I think it's a great picture that really visualizes what he does. Now, our, uh, so yeah. our last for one. of the podcast, like Miss Batchman said, is referred to as um, Dante, the artist. I'm sorry, the author. Uh, and he writes allegories, does poetry, and his book is called Divine Comedy. And there is an allegory that he does. It's famously called The Inferno of Dante. Um, some of you might have, you know, there's a, there's a newer, like, uh, Da Vinci Code-style movie called Inferno that's supposed to be based around that story. But this is your first real book that details what they think hell is going to be like. So... This is Dante's, like, you know, in a way he's writing his protagonist's character's soul's journey through, like, the seven rings of hell. And it's extremely graphic. It's one of the, it's a challenging read. Did you already add it to the uh, I did. screen? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch to that so you all can see it. And then I will kind of do the view here and uh, kind of go past the little mat. Okay, here we go. So, first of all is, I, like I said, I know his style of clothing is very strange, but... Uh, again, you see the uh, the rings, the layers of hell in the background with like, it looks like the sort of angels or, or people know they're carrying and they're doing manual labor and suffering constantly. And it's supposed to be basically the soul's journey to salvation, like fighting through hell in purgatory, which is kind of like hell's waiting room and, and working their way out. And you see the people that are naked on the bottom left side that are that are being tortured by demons. You can, you can barely see it. It's a dark picture. And then... This is extremely important for our next chapter. Uh, to the right of Dante, you see a very famous city. This is what's called the birthplace of the Renaissance, which is our next chapter. This is a city called Florence. And some of you might have seen this in games like Assassin's Creed before or in, in different movies like the movie Inferno or something like that. You see a, a city that has mostly orangish red roofs. And in the middle of the city is this amazing cathedral with a dome on top of it. And we'll, we'll show plenty of that stuff later on because... This is where he's at. He's a Middle Ages writer, but he's also known as a humanist Renaissance writer. So he is our first author of the year that we're discussing. And keep in mind the context here is that he is writing this book right at the end or towards the, the decline of the plague. And what this book is really saying about society. Now, Miss Basham, as a devil's advocate, 
if you were a normal peasant or a normal person in a society or in a city or working on the farms, you were a very faithful person, though, and you were very superstitious. This book comes out. You hear about the book. After the printing pass, maybe you might be able to, to read it later on. But you more hear about this book and what it actually talks about. What effect could that have on you mentally and emotionally? Oh, my gosh. Well, if you were already a very superstitious person, you already were – naturally terrified of hell this I, I think would just up it so much more because we had to read it in college it was a very graphic descriptive um version of hell and so when if you're just hearing about it from people just saying oh well guess it talks about this and this and this i'm gonna be thinking in my head i better get to church and i better up my tithing <laughs> and so um i you know, I think that more people would be going to church and trying to not end up uh, right here. Yeah, and since people know that they could be killed indiscriminately, Dante's concern was more of, you know, he was doing this for the people. That's why he's called a humanist. He, he wasn't doing this for the church necessarily, and he had some conflictions after he was exiled from the, the city of Florence, and that's why he's on the outside gates of this. If you notice, too, I thought this was kind of interesting, Ms. Basham. Do you notice that the wall on the left side of him and the, the gates on the right side, it's kind of like he's standing in, in the gates of hell, like it's open, but it's kind of like he's standing at, at, at the gates of that. Like he's trying yeah, to keep you from, from crossing. He, he doesn't yeah. want you to end up there. Yeah, and he's using his skill as a poet to write to help other normal human beings to, because he knows their main concern is their salvation. They know that they could die at any moment, that they're at a risk of doing that. And, and even though like in our society today, you see mainly it's elderly people or young children or immune compromise that's susceptible to the coronavirus. But if you look, that doesn't mean that everybody in the middle of that is immune. You've seen random stories here. There were a 25-year-old passes away, an 18-year-old, 30-something-year-old. And depending on certain situations where it may even have a long-term effect on your heart or your breathing or, or whatnot. So in this case, it's, it's, it's even worse, way worse of a situation that they're in. So in a way... He, he shows what he thinks what hell would probably be like. And this is definitely, like you said earlier, Ms. Basham, it's kind of like that, that fire and brimstone sort of preaching that you might get sometimes. And it, 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 look, it does not hold back either. It is very graphic about that. But he's also trying to say this is how, this is what human beings need to do to get to salvation, to get to heaven. Uh, and, and he does it as though if his soul is going through hell, trying to fight its way through purgatory and getting eventually to heaven. It's a very interesting book. I have read it before. It is very challenging to read, but it, it is a good topic to end on because our next chapter is the Renaissance, which is a rebirth of the old ideas. Go back to that last episode podcast where Miss Basham found that painting of the fall of Rome and how society was before that. So we, we've gone through like this, the Dark Ages really quickly, or the Middle Ages really quickly. So now we're going to start seeing a resurgence of some of those old ideas. So people like Dante help that. They're, they're, they're writing more about the, the point of view of life or death in this matter, and afterlife, from the point of view as a human, rather than only writing for religious scripture or only writing for uh, what a noble wants or what like that. And again, you're going to start seeing paintings of like normal people, like Mona Lisa. Uh, you're going to start seeing things like that. It's not just wealthy people's portraits that it could afford them. So you're going to start seeing a shift where there's a little, a little bit less of a focus on, I guess you can say like, uh, as a, much of a focus on religion and a little bit more of a focus uh, in society on the individual. But I will admit, in these smaller areas where if you're a peasant and you're working on the farms, for the most part, they won't really notice that yet. Many of them are illiterate. They're still detached from the cities. It's mainly in these cities like Florence and Venice and these Italian states where they're really going to start picking up on this new resurgence of new ideas. And, and of course, the church is going to start adjusting and, and reforming to some of these ideas too, but not before trying to... Um, have some moments where there was a little bit of corruption because of what some leaders were doing at that time. Other than that, Mrs. Basham, is there anything that you want to add to the end of this podcast? So now we're, we're looking ahead a little bit. I, I've talked a little bit about looking ahead. Just to conclude, is there anything that you want to say? Uh, I just think, I just think that, that an important thing to note is how we talked, we foreshadowed earlier about people starting to really divide and split as far as religion goes. 
So as we're going into the next chapter, start looking at, I'm talking to the students right now, to start looking and thinking, okay, how is this different than the last chapter? What, what could have caused this, this change to occur? So that I think is going to be a really important theme that we're going to hit on this next Absolutely. unit. Absolutely. And again, with, with the writing, it's going to be very artistic. Um, again, there will be graphic pictures. I mean, you're going to see nudity in that one, but you're old enough to, and mature enough to be able to handle that. Um, and, and you're going to see very religious themed paintings. And then there's also different Renaissance paintings that are more humanistic paintings. You're going to see writing about like death and about love. People like Petarch, people like the students have probably heard of Shakespeare before. He's in the Renaissance. So you see these stories and allegories and plays and whatnot, more about the what are humans capable of doing. It's not just that we're only a creation of God, but we're a creation of God to them that can be celebrated for what we can do. Things that Leonardo da Vinci can do and Raphael and Donatello, and Michelangelo, and so many other topics that we'll hit on later. So just keep in mind, uh, students, that this is the shift that you need to notice now. These are some of the changes that you're going to notice. Um, other than that, I think this concludes episode five. I, I think that it's been a great couple of episodes. I hope that it helps you on your assignment next week just some last advice we want to have this in our directions we highly recommend you to check the john green crash course videos out to watch last episode in this episode because i will promise you your five assignments next week on google classroom will be so much easier if you read the notes that we post from google slides or check out these videos and throughout these videos i probably will bookmark at the beginning what time certain topics are so for example if you weren't as good with the uh great famine then i'll, I'll bookmark exactly what what time the great famine was on other than that i hope you all have a wonderful day and take care